Ipswich, Massachusetts, uh, one of the most beautiful New England towns I've ever been in. And, uh, and I used to live around here, so I've been in a few. So thanks for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here today. We're going to be talking a little bit about time, but it's not time as you might expect. Um, I think we've come to think about time as one of those things, right? Like it, it, it's, uh, it's urgent, it's uh, relentless, it never stops, the demands continue, uh, and, in, and in a way it can create a lot of pressure. And if you ex accept it that on those terms, it can create a lot of pressure. As a matter of fact, I know a guy, um, and he ran a very successful company for many years. Uh, but at one point he realized he was running his company by this to-do list that he made for himself every day. And, um, and as, he, as he would work his way through that to-do list, if he didn't get enough done, it, it weighed on him. It was, uh, it was a, a demanding, it was like a, um, it was like a slave driver. His to-do list was a slave driver. And he actually said at one point, it was like it picked him up out of his chair this pressure, like wrung him out and hurled him back at his chair. And now this is a president of a big company who, who felt that way because he'd allowed time to start to dictate his, his life. So what we're going to be talking about today is not uh, time management as much as it is uh, understanding the limitless nature of your life and being able to accomplish whatever it is that is really for you to do whatever is yours to do. And it's not due to do a uh, to-do list and it's not due to a clock uh, that enables that. And as a matter of fact, um, I'll bet everyone here has had some experience or, or knows someone who's had some amazing experience where some, something happened that could not have possibly happened and yet somehow it did. Uh, these things, um, they're not that rare. And in fact, they should be less rare than they are. They should be very common occurrences. Uh, time management, just to get this kind of covered a little bit, time management begins from the premise that you have a limited something, a precious resource called time. And if you don't manage it right, you're going to miss out on something important. So that's the basic, of time, the basic premise of time management. And we're coming from a different premise, which is you got all the resources you will ever need to do what it is that is yours to do, including time. Now, um, the first point that I uh, would, would touch on is that this is nothing new. This is just the truth of life. And we're, we're in an age right now where there's a lot of pressure on, on folks. Um, but all through time, there has been interesting examples and people that have glimpsed those examples where life is actually free, where you can do what it, whatever it is that is yours to do. Um, in, in physics, time is a, what they call a fundamental quantity. And um, there are seven fundamental quantities. There used to be four. Now there are seven. Time is among them. Uh, but even in physics, time is um, problematic because things happen faster than is physically possible. And they're not just theoretical, they've actually been observed where things are impossible physically and yet they happen. And so they try to uh, explain it. There's a lot of um, explanation that goes on. As a matter of fact, um, decades ago they wrote a... They wrote a uh, a theory called the entanglement theory, where somehow in one part of the universe there's a particle that is somehow entangled with another particle in another part of the universe because things happen between them that is physically impossible. Einstein called it um, spooky action at a distance, which isn't, you know, it's about what it's worth because it is an enigmatic situation and uh, to try to explain it down to the last final detail might not be worth doing. There's a guy, uh, I found a book recently by a guy named George Musser from, he's a contributing editor for Scientific American. 
He's from Brown University and he wrote a book called Spooky Action at a Distance after Einstein's statement. He said, Albert Einstein struggled with these strange occurrences and his description of them gives this book its title. Non-local phenomena so violate what we believe about the physical world that they appear almost magical. Okay, and I think actually a lot of what we're going to be discussing today does violate what we've come to expect. And so be it, so be it. Let it, let it violate what we've come to expect. He says this, Musser points out, contrary to our intuitions, space and time may not be fundamental ingredients of the world. Instead, they may be constructions. And every time you have a construction, you can have an imperfection in that construction. And so we do with time. Um, you know, occasionally you'll read that uh, tonight they're going to tweak the world clock, you know, just by a couple of milliseconds, you know, just to bring everything back online. They, it, it has to be adjusted. So it's a useful construction, but it is a construction. You know, we, um, I use a watch. I have a very accurate watch. These watches get more accurate all the time. I use a calendar. You know, as she mentioned, I've done many, many, many production schedules based on calendars and clocks and so forth. Uh, but I've had a lot of experience kind of pressing back against the inevitability of this hard thing. And I don't mean asking for more time. What I mean is allowing things to be possible that don't seem possible. Have you ever heard the phrase, a work expands to fill the time available? Yes. Yes. It's a fairly, you know, it's a routine phrase. It's a fairly common phrase. But I've noticed the opposite is also true. That time will enable you to do what is necessary. And I've got a few examples I'll share with you. Somebody one time asked me, uh, have you ever stopped time? I said, I don't think I've stopped time, but I've definitely seen it expand. I've definitely seen it expand where things happen that uh, don't seem possible, and yet there they are. And I've seen it a lot, actually, uh, over the years. As a matter of fact, um, I used to live here in Weston, not far from here, right? And um, I owned a, a trailer, like it was a uh, utility trailer. And I used to take it by the church every couple times a year, and they'd fill it with debris, and then I would take it and dump it. And one time I was picking it up on a Saturday night, and one of the guys said, hey, uh, Dave, can you bring that trailer back here tomorrow? And I was thinking, I was thinking, okay, well, tomorrow they're going to be at my house doing this, and I'm going to have to go do this, and I can't really turn around in there with a trailer. So I'm, I'm just thinking it over. And the guy said to me, um, it's not that tough a question, Dave, just yes or no. And I said, you know, I'm trying to figure out a way to say yes. And... Um, I did, I did, by the way, I did find a way to say yes, and that trailer was back there the next day. But the thing in, t in time management, you guys have probably had these, these classes too and these seminars on time management. Uh, one of the key things is you gotta learn to say no. And I would say, don't learn to say no. Learn to say, maybe, maybe if it's right, yes. If it's a right idea, then yes. You know, there was a woman that called me up uh, one night. I'm a, I'm a Christian science practitioner, and people call at different times for different needs, a variety of different needs. And uh, this uh, young woman called, and she was supposed to go to Mexico the next, the following day. This was a Sunday night, um, around 11 o'clock on a Sunday night. And she didn't have her passport. And her passport, she felt, had been uh, misplaced or stolen because it was... Um, she felt it had been in an unsecured location. So I asked, um, let me ask you this question. I have one question. You supposed to go to Mexico tomorrow? I know you want to go. I know you think you're going. I know you bought a ticket. I know everyone's expecting you to go. The question is, are you supposed to go? And she thought a minute and said, I think I am. I said, good, then go and forget the passport. Stop looking for that passport. You've already looked everywhere for it. Just get ready to go to Mexico. I said, when's your flight? She says, tomorrow at uh, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Monday afternoon, 5 o'clock. I said, fine. At, at 1 o'clock, call me and say, Dave, everything's cool. She goes, man, you sound so confident. 
I said, you know, I am pretty confident because I'm pretty confident that you are going to be where you need to be. And if that's on your way to Mexico, then you're going to be on your way to Mexico. And about, um, about a half hour later or so, uh, she called and, uh, and uh, had her passport. And all she had done was open her suitcase and move forward. Uh, and she found her passport in her suitcase. The thing is, um, if we allow these, these uh, accoutrements of, of material life or human life to stop us or tell us what we can and can't do, we'll get stopped everywhere. But if we align ourselves with this divine mind, this divine presence, uh, we're going to be where we need to be, and, and that which we need is going to be there when we get there. You know, I, speaking of which, I know a woman who was traveling to Boston from uh, Chicago, and she was traveling through O'Hare, and she realized that she didn't have her boarding pass, her ticket. And at that time, the boarding pass was kind of a big deal. You know, it's kind of like, a, almost like a cash document. It had, it had value. Today, you know, you just print another one when you get to the gate. But she, she felt she had to stop and not move forward because she didn't have this very, very important document, like a passport. And then she stopped herself and she said, hold it, I, I'm not gonna stop. I'm going forward. This is not my trip. This is divine mind's unfoldment. And she moved forward and got off of one of those moving walkways and saw a boarding pass on the ground. Turned, it out, turned out it was hers. Now you might say, well, that just is, is amazing. Okay, it is. So be it. It's amazing. And, and uh, how does that happen? I'll tell you how I think it happens. She moved forward. She did that what she thought we sh she should have done, should be doing, rather than what the human circumstances were, were going to allow her to do. Now, in metaphysics, time is irrelevant. Um, time and space together. Um, if I were to say to you something like, um, you know, Boston Garden or, or um, Golden Gate Bridge or some concept that you know, it doesn't take any time for you to have that image. It's a, it's a, it's a metaphysical concept. If I say to you, um, oh, something like uh, Eiffel Tower, it's immediate. It's immediate. And that term immediate, by the way, means um, already. The, the term is already. It's already done. And uh, in the Bible, you have, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, you don't hear that word uh, immediate. But in the New Testament, you do. And you hear it maybe, I don't know, 50 times, 50, 60 times. Mostly having to do with Jesus, sometimes having to do with Paul sometimes having to do with Jesus' disciples. And, uh, you know, you remember some examples, like immediately the ship was at the shore where they were going, or immediately the feet and ankle bones received strength. Immediately it fell from his eyes as it had been scales. You know, there are a variety of those instances. And, and, and again, if you think of it in terms of already, then nothing needs to happen. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at... Um, by the way, this just came off of uh, Google, so this, this is not deep research or anything, but the word uh, immediate, without any intervening time or space, without the interference of a medium, it's right now, it's already. So that may violate what we've come to expect from the physical world, so be it. Let, it, let that be the truth. You know, I just pulled a few of these. You could probably find 50 of these in the Bible. Um, there's a lot of ways to look at the Bible. I think there are actually seven agreed upon interpretations of the Bible. There's the literal and the historical and the mystical and the allegorical. I don't remember them all. But the one that I think we ought to be looking at and, um, and kind of focused on is the spiritual. Because that's the one that remains true today. That's the one that speaks into our lives, our human experience, and, uh, and uplifts those. Um, I'm going to read something. This is, um, this is a, a collection of writings by a woman named Mary Baker Eddy. I'm going to talk a little bit about her in a minute. But, but um, 
just one thing that she said on this topic. The scriptures cannot properly be spiritually, cannot pot properly be interpreted in a literal way. The truths they teach must be spiritually discerned before their message can be borne fully to our minds and our hearts. So rather than arguing about the details of how long it was or how far it was that Jesus walked or how far did Paul walk, um, the, the question is, what did they say that remains true in our lives today? That's the key. And by the way, if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll give you an example of something that happened in my life where um, it was a very practical problem and it got solved precisely. And neither the problem nor the solution had been invented at the time the truth that healed it had been written. So here are a few. I'm just going to share a couple of these. God is our refuge and strength. Very present. Very present. Not just present. Very present. And by the way, present has both a space and a time connotation. Present here, present now. Divine mind. You know, there are a lot of ways to talk about God. Um, the great creator, the intelligence of the universe. Um, the one that I, I like, and at least for the purposes of us today, I think it's an easy one to consider, and that's divine mind. The Bible says God is love. The Bible says God is spirit. The idea that God is mind brings it exactly home right now, right here. And this concept of very present um, is uh, echoed in that concept that, that there is divine mind. Um, I do want to introduce this book, and maybe this is a good moment to do it. This is another book by Mary Baker Eddy. This is probably the, the key work of, of her lifetime. She, she, she was an author and she wrote a lot. But she kept coming back to this and perfected it and perfected it and perfected it over a period of about 40 years. This was originally uh, published in 1875, and um, millions and millions of them have been printed ever since. And you can see this one's all beat up. I've got it all tabbed up. These books do get used pretty hard. Uh, people use them every day. They look for um, ideas that will open up their consciousness now even though the book is 150 years old. Uh, here's one thing I wanted to kind of show. On page, um, this is actually in the preface. Mary Baker Eddy writes this. Uh, Darkness gives place to light. Darkness gives place to light. Now, as then, these mighty works are not supernatural. And we said a few minutes ago, this should happen every day. It seems like it's a great big thing, but it should happen multiple times a day. These are not supernatural, supremely natural. They are the sign of Emmanuel or God with us. A divine influence ever present, this says very present, a divine influence ever present in human consciousness and repeating itself. That's divine mind ever present in human consciousness and repeating itself. And if we can listen to that, it shakes the limits, it shakes the fear, it shakes any sense of I can't or what does the clock tell me I can do? If we're listening to that divine influence which is ever present in our human consciousness, we're going to do things that we've that have never been done before and that we certainly never thought we could do. Here's one. God is in the midst of her. God shall help her. And that right early. God shall help her early. That's a time reference. By the way, I'm going to just see if I can just adjust that a little bit. Um, early is a time reference. You know, um, my mother told me when I was a little kid, I couldn't have been more than, I'm thinking four years old, maybe five years old. She said, if you ever get in real trouble, you can reach out to God and God will help you. And uh, I didn't think much of it at the time, but I did remember it because uh, a couple of weeks later, I had climbed up on this dresser, maybe it was about that high, about that high, and I threw a pillow up there. 
and, and uh, I was going to call my brother into the room. I used to share a room with my older brother, and I was going to call him into the room, and from this highly advantageous elevated position, I was going to come down on him with this pillow. So that was my little scheme. In the process of this, though, I was on my knees and I fell, and I fell backwards. And, um, you know, even a little kid knows when he's got real problems. That was one of those moments, and I realized this is bad. It's very disconcerting to be falling backwards and looking at the ceiling. And um, I reached, I remember my mom told me I could reach out to God if I ever get in such a situation. So I did. I said, God, you got to help me. And it came as an idea. By the way, divine mind, ever present, very present, speaking to us into the human consciousness, shows up with ideas. Divine mind brings us ideas. And an idea came to me in that little split second as I was falling, and it was to interlock my fingers like that and to put my hands behind my head. Now, when you put your hands behind your head like that, the, palm, the palms kind of are down. And as I was falling, there was a doorknob about here, and my hands came around that doorknob. It just happened to call, come right around that doorknob, and I caught it. And then my feet came down flat on the floor, and the whole thing was over. Yeah, exactly. It was kind of, um, I've thought about that since. I, I don't think I ever mentioned that to my mother, but I have thought about it. Because I thought, here's a little kid. I didn't know there was a doorknob there. I guarantee I wasn't reaching for a doorknob. I was reaching into the divine for something I had to have right now. And it came to me as an idea. And the idea was implementable even for a little kid, midair. That's how quick this is. It's, it's quick and it's early. You, you know, my mother told me that two, three weeks before I needed it. That's how early it is. It shows up when you require it, and it's present for you, this, these divine ideas. And they're accessible. You know, if there's one thing that I hope we could kind of leave with today, it's a sense of the accessibility, the immediacy, the ever-presentness of this divine consciousness. This, this is just one more of these. You could probably find, as I say, you could probably find 50 of these. We shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Now, had that said in the blink of an eye, you could probably put a super slow-mo camera on a blink and time it. You can't time a twinkle. That's right now. That's all immediate. So those are just a few. Um, you know, I mentioned science and health. And uh, I know there are some copies here. Are there, are there some copies outside? Yeah. And, and um, you can also buy these at the Christian Science Reading Room right here in Ipswich. Uh, it's open almost every day, and you can go in and grab one of these. Uh, and I recommend you do. I mean, if you're watching this or listening to this, um, you've come this far, and I'd go find the book. I really would. You know, I was sitting on an airplane the other day, and a, and a guy asked me, uh, do you have patience? And I said, yes. He said, do you have students? I said, yes. He said, do you, have a, do you have a website? I said, yes. He said, do you have a book? I said, yes, but I didn't write it. This is the book. It's called Science and Health, written by a New England woman named Mary Baker Eddy. And, uh, and in fact, right here, just south of here, is the world headquarters for the Christian Science Church, all of which she founded. But, um, Anyway, so that's a little bit about science and health. They do get used hard, like you can see, that one's all beautiful and mine's all shot. But, uh, but it's a highly developed, highly evolved textbook. They call it a textbook for life. So I'd, uh, I recommend it, I do recommend it. Just a, a couple of points about the author. The book didn't come from nowhere. The book was written by this woman who was born in uh, Bow, New Hampshire. Uh, she spent basically her entire life here in New England, um, a lot of it in the Boston area and a lot of it in New Hampshire. And she, uh, she started, as, as most young girls, I suppose, in the early part of the 19th century, um, with few prospects, I think. I mean, uh, 
somehow she was able to press back against the limitations that were confronting her and she ended up with a very solid education. As a matter of fact, the vocabulary that it found its way into her writings is amazing. She was a poet and she was a, an author and she was a, she was a theologian. She was um, a scholar in her own right. But she had to deal with a lot of the same kinds of issues that you and I deal with. Issues of um, home, issues of family, issues of you know, needing to get an education, needing to um, uh, fund your, your life. And she ended up publishing her own books, publishing her own magazines. As a matter of fact, outside here and at the Christian Science Reading Room, you will find um, current issues of the magazines that she founded over 100 years ago. And they've been published. She was the original uh, publisher and the original editor, but they're still being published. So, uh, and in fact, this meeting, and, and I serve on the Christian Science Board of of a lectureship. And uh, that entire board of lectureship is just a continuation of, of what she established all those years ago. So she ended up uh, making a difference, I would say, and having a very wide footprint. There are uh, branch churches all over the world. And uh, I belong to one, I live in Chicago. You know, I've probably said this two or three times already, but I think it bears repeating. Uh, if it's yours to do, do it. If it's necessary for you to do, you can do it. And don't think you can't. Do not think you are limited. You know, this is an interesting little phrase. This is another one of these little nuggets that you find in the Bible. Uh, it was one written by Paul. He said, the man of God, by the way, the man of God, just to be clear, is not somebody who's gotten a divinity degree or somebody who's a, it's, it's, it's us. It's us. Um, our friend uh, Tyndale, William Tyndale, who began the translation, he actually completed the first really thorough translation of the Bible into English because he realized that the man of God was us and we deserve to be able to read it. So he translated it into English. He said, if God grants me the time the boy driving the plow will know more of the Bible than the Pope himself. So it's us. The man of God is us. And um, this is an interesting statement, though, that the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. Throughly furnished. And when I, you know, I, I have a background in uh, graphic arts and printing and so forth. And when I first read that, I, th I assumed it was a typo. I assumed that word throughly meant, was meant to be thoroughly, and that eventually they would fix it. Uh, but I've come to realize that, no, no, that's actually what the intended word. So I went to figure out what it meant. And it has two meanings, completely equipped and utterly capable. So if I'm completely equipped and utterly capable, why would I ever say I don't have enough time? Right? Or I don't have enough money. Or I don't have the right car. Or I don't have the right education. Or whatever it might be. If it is for me to do, I need to do it. If it's for me to go to Mexico, I need to go to Mexico. And stop looking for excuses. So, I was, um, I was riding across. I used to, as I say, I used to live here in Weston. And I was riding across the country one time on my motorcycle. And I was headed uh, up on the north shore of Lake Michigan, and I was going toward Sault Ste. Marie, which is where the, 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 all the Great Lakes kind of combine there. There's locks there at Sault Ste. Marie. And I was going to cut through there and cut across Canada to uh, come back to my home here in, in uh, Massachusetts and uh, ride the last thousand miles across Canada. And as I was um, traveling on that beautiful little two-lane highway up in the Upper Peninsula right along Lake Michigan, which was on my right, I thought, you know, this is enough for today. I think I'll uh, pull into this campground, set up a tent, and uh, get some, you know, get some rest. And in the morning, it was a really beautiful day, sunny and bright and dry. And I, uh, I sat, as I often do, and I just sat for a few minutes and just kind of contemplated things and prayed a little and maybe allowed that divine 
mind, that divine influence that's ever present in human consciousness to speak to my human consciousness a little bit. And uh, I ended up writing this down. This is, um, again, from um, Mary Baker Eddy, and I sort of just sort of randomly remembered it, and I wrote it down from memory. Remember, thou canst be brought into no condition, be it ever so severe, where love has not been before thee, and where its tender lesson is not awaiting thee. Then I hopped on my bike, packed up my gear, and uh, headed north towards Sault Ste. Marie. But now when I got back out to this little highway, this beautiful little two-lane highway, all of a sudden this thing was very busy. There were a lot of trucks, a lot of traffic, a lot of um, uh, speed. It was like 70 miles an hour. And, and, and so it's, a, it's a kind of a serious situation. And there's no way to enter this stream of traffic. You just have to do 70 miles an hour like right now. So I made sure I was on a little curve like this. And I made sure that I had a lane to, to my left. And when I was sure I was clear, I accelerated and jumped into, into my lane and headed north. But when I looked up, I realized I don't really have a lane because there's a, uh, there's a truck in my lane passing another truck. So there were two trucks uh, leaving me really nowhere. And um, I later calculated that that was about 100 feet, that the interval between me and this truck was about 100 feet, which is about one second, really, at, at 70 miles an hour. The interval on that is about um, one second, a little less. So if somebody had given me a work order that said, Dave, uh, you're going to have one second to move your motorcycle from, from in front of a truck traveling 70 miles an hour, I'd have said, no, I'm not going to do that because there's not enough time you know, for that. But as it worked out, I didn't have that choice because I found myself in that situation. And so um, just to tell you kind of how it went, because, because we were talking earlier about how things happen fast and how I've seen things expand to enable what is necessary, and this was kind of one of those things. The first thing I saw from the lines painted on the road was that the driver in my lane was making a legal pass. So he was passing a, a truck legally. Now you might say, yeah, but that doesn't change anything. And it does. It's just the first thing I noticed. Second thing I saw was the truck was trying to give me some room. I could kind of just feel it. By the way, nobody honked, which I think was helpful, the fact that nobody honked. Because that would have introduced um, alarm into that one second. There was no alarm in that one second. There was just me being aware of what was going on and the driver being aware of what was going on because I think he saw it happening before I did because I could see him trying to make some room. I noticed then a little tiny sliver of asphalt just outside of his lane, just outside of my lane, and I put my bike there. And then I raised my right hand to signal to the driver if you will not jackknife your truck, I think I'll be okay here. And as I noticed he, who was like right here now, I noticed he reached across his steering wheel and kind of waved to me. And uh, we passed. Now, I, um, I was thinking, you know, that was kind of a lot, right, for one second. There was recognition. There was awareness, there was activity, there was communication, there was goodwill expressed, there was safety expressed. There was um, even a little bit of like a, like a little gentlemanliness expressed between the two of us. And then I, I went by him and I had to stay where I was because there were a couple other cars behind him making the same pass. I stayed where I was for another couple seconds, then I accelerated and headed for Sault Ste. Marie. I was telling my sister about that later, and she said, Did, well, didn't you pull over and kind of like get squared away and get some cold water on your face? I said, no, but I was thinking about it because I was thinking that was severe. Okay, that was maybe ever so severe. So if it's severe, then there's a lesson in here for me somewhere. It's because this has been promised to me, and I just came across this 10 minutes ago. So I was thinking, riding north, I'm thinking, well, what's my lesson? 
And it occurred to me, time does not limit your life. Because there wasn't enough time for what just happened there, and yet your life was untouched by it. Time, or the lack of time, cannot take away your life. And as I was riding along, and I was just thinking about this, because it definitely was, it, it moved me, and I was thinking about this. This is another one of these little, these little nuggets that you find uh, in the Bible. And it's been there looking at us for thousands of years. And we've probably read it hundreds of times. And we've probably wondered, what does that really mean? Well, I started to do the math on that. Because I figured, well, if one day is worth a thousand years, I thought, what, what is one second? And I did the calculation on it because I had all day. I was just riding for Sault Ste. Marie. And by the time you do the math, it's a little bit of a computation. But by the time you figure it all out, it's um, 4.2 days. So by this spiritual equation, I actually had 4.2 days to resolve that situation. In which case, time's not even a factor. I mean, if, if somebody had got, given you a work order and said, you're going to have 4.2 days to move a motorcycle from in front of a truck, bah, cake, right? Time's not an issue. OK, well, time is not an issue when you define your life spiritually. When you define your life spiritually, your life is immediate. It's not, it's not limited by time. The question is, if time is not a factor, what is? What enables, uh, what enables things to unfold the way they should when it doesn't look like they can? And, um, you know, I want to read something to you guys. This book, Science and Health, it's been called a uh, salvation. It's the... Um, it's the key to salvation. It's been called that. And, and it's got a lot of interesting concepts in here, one of which is a, a glossary of terms. And if you get near the back, it's not very long. It's uh, 20, 30 pages. But it includes a lot of terms. Um, a lot of them are Bible terms that are given a spiritual um, interpretation of the Bible terms. A lot of them are just simple um, words everyday words like time. Time is in here. But the word that I kind of wanted to share with you is the word miracle. The word miracle shows up in here in this glossary and here it is. That which is divinely natural but must be learned humanly. And we were talking earlier, this is not supernatural. This is divinely natural and it must be learned humanly. And how does it get learned humanly? Because we listen to that divine uh, influence ever present in human consciousness and then do what it allows us to do. It enables us to do amazing things. Time would tell us you can't and divine mind will tell you of course you can. If it's yours to do, you certainly can. Now, um, I would say w one of the things that this book does, and it does it over and over and over again. It's a concept that's explained over and over and over again. And it's the distinction between Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus the Christ. Same guy, really the same guy, but not identical. The Christ is distinct from the man that, that lived it. Um, I'll share, I, I, I say this gets made, this point gets made over and over again. I'll share just two or three of them. Jesus was born of Mary. Christ is the true idea of voicing good, the divine message from God speaking to the human consciousness. Okay, there it is again. This divine influence ever present in human consciousness. The word Christ is not properly a synonym for Jesus, though it is commonly so used. Christ is not a name so much as the divine title of Jesus. And the advent of Jesus of Nazareth marked the first century of the Christian era, but the Christ is without beginning of years or end of days. The Christ is present now. And Jesus said that himself too. He said, um, anytime two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. He said, uh, he said this, um, 
Abraham, right? Abraham lived, I think, 2,000 years prior to Jesus. And yet Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. The Bible says that Abraham was um, looking for a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God. That's what Abraham, somehow Abraham had it in his heart to look for that. And he found it, according to, according to Jesus. So it's this Christ. This is, um, this is an illustration. Um, you know, Jesus used a lot of illustrations. He used, uh, like, um, the mustard seed. You say, you know, it's like this mustard seed. It has everything, and yet it, it looks so tiny, and yet it's the greatest of all seeds. He said, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like this flower. Look at this flower. He used illustrations. And this is kind of an illustration. This is just an illustration that I found that I think makes a point. And I'll, I'll just explain it to you. It's like the Christ truth, pure truth, enters the human consciousness, is constantly present in the human consciousness, and is able to expand into the most amazing things humanly. So our lives can express that pure light of the Christ, in the most amazing, colorful, beautiful, uh, lovely, innovative, progressive things. Now, we're not talking about light. Actually, light is, uh, is matter. It, it has weight to it. They're particles of light. We're, we're talking about thought. And so all these illustrations do collapse at some point. Keep, keep in mind that we're, just, we're talking pure spirit here, pure mind. If you think that you are um, running out of time, you know, we came up against uh, April 15th not long ago here, and there was probably a lot of urgency and pressure uh, surrounding that. It's always an idea that's going to enable us to do what it is we need to do. It's, you're probably not going to get more time usually. You can file for extensions and stuff if you want to, but essentially what you need is a better idea. Um, let me read something to you if I can find it here. I think I've got this tabbed. Yeah. This is again from Mary Baker Eddy. She says, God gives you his spiritual ideas, and in turn, they give you daily supplies. Never ask for tomorrow. It is enough that divine love is an ever present help, and if you wait, never doubting, you will have all you need every moment. By the way, she doesn't say, I will, she says, You will. You will have everything you need. God gives you his spiritual ideas. You know, I have a friend who's, um, who's an architect. He lives not far from here. He lives in, uh, in Lincoln. And he, uh, he was late on a project. And it was an architectural model. And he was so late that it was making him nervous. It was like affecting him physically. And again, the clock will do that. If you allow the clock to run your life, It'll affect you physically that way. And, uh, but he had, over lunch one day, he was irretrievably late on the project, but over lunch one day, there was a little girl present. He sneezed, and this little girl said, God bless you. And suddenly he got an idea, right? It came to him as an idea. And the idea was, uh, you don't have to paint those pieces with a brush. You can spray paint those pieces. That was the idea. And I don't know if you've ever done any spray painting. I've done some. And it's beyond fast. Like, I remember when I was doing it, I look around and go, where's the rest of it? And I go, that's all done already. It's fast. And he ended up delivering that project early. Okay? So he was irretrievably late, got a new idea, and now he delivers it early. You know, I'm going to fly to Chicago. And it's going to take a couple hours, right? Maybe two hours. But 100 years ago, that would have been a big deal, going to Chicago. It's the thing is, you get better ideas all the time. And as you do, they eclipse time. Time, time gets, uh, gets uh, taken care of in the process of a better idea. It's always going to come as a better idea. The idea of, of the now, and a lot of people do talk about this and think about it. And I think it's really worth thinking about, because if we can operate in the in the eternal now, then there is no worry. If you find yourself worrying, I'd step back from that and say, hold it, hold it, hold it. I'm, I'm doing something wrong here if I'm going to worry. 
Uh, people have said that worry is like ingratitude in advance. They've, I've heard people describe it as um, like sitting in a rocking chair. It makes you feel like you're doing something, but you're really going nowhere. It's, it's, a, it's a really a kind of a wasted effort, worry. And frankly, so is uh, regret. If you, if you want to get rid of regret, I would recommend you think of yourself the way God knows you. Because if you, because if you think of, for instance, that prodigal son, the story that Jesus told of that prodigal son, when he came back, he was full of regret. But when he got back, the father made nothing of any of that. He didn't say, well, I hope you've learned your lesson. He didn't say anything like that. He said, put a ring on his hand. Put a robe on this guy. Get him back here. This is where he belongs. So I would, uh, to, to lose regret, um, number one, stop doing whatever it is you regret doing. And number two, just know yourself the way God knows you, the way the div divine mind knows you. Um, procrastination, that simply means in Latin, it means forward to tomorrow which just messes up tomorrow. So my, my recommendation is do all you can today and don't forward anything to, to tomorrow. Tomorrow's got its own issues. Um, salvation is happening right now. This is the day of salvation. You've heard the, the, the phrase, uh, he saved the day, save the day. This is the day to save. There's a, um, there's a reading list outside there. I, I saw some copies out there and you can grab one. And, um, and if, you, uh, if they run out, you can download it if you want it from my website. It's 17 pages of articles and quotes and stuff on this topic. And so you may not want it, but um, one of them is an article called um, High Stakes Project Led by Prayer. And I recommend you take a look at that. It's just, I won't give you the whole story, but there's a young woman responsible for a, a big project, a lot of moving pieces, a lot of money at stake. A lot of people depending on her, and she's getting it done. And then they throw a curve, as sometimes happens. You get a curve thrown at you, just when you do if nearing the finish line. And she realized, ah, this is coming apart. And she was on this stairway to go and see her, her boss and tell him or her that I'm not going to get it done after all. And on the stairs, she got an idea. And the idea, uh, she turned around on the stairs, made a phone call, and the stuff was delivered within 15 minutes and the whole thing was back on track. It, it comes as an idea. Now, in her case, um, in her case, it had to do with the fact that they already have it. Um, here it is. Here it is, in, from Science and Health. It says, science reveals the possibility of achieving all good and sets mortals at work to discover what God has already done. There it is, that word already. But distrust of one's ability to gain the goodness desired and to bring out better and higher results often hampers the trial of one's wings and ensures failure at the outset. You might say, oh, there's no way, I, I haven't got time. And then all of a sudden, you've, you've decided, before you even take the first step, that you can't. As soon as you decide you can't, you can't. I'll make one quick thing about almost, by the way. Almost sounds pretty good, but it's tied linguistically to the term penury, which means extreme poverty. So you don't want almost. You want already. Um, if it's ever been true, uh, it's still true. Truth does not come and go. Um, the truth is not, I'll tell you what comes and goes. Fashion comes and goes. Um, um, uh, let's say uh, traditions come and go. But uh, truth is firm and it never, it never changes. Uh, you know, one time I was cooking spaghetti in a, in a dark kitchen for some reason, and I still do this very dim light in the kitchen and a, a noodle rolled across this cooktop and I went to pick it up and I had to press my fingers down hard on the cooktop to pick this noodle up and uh, as I did I, I didn't realize how hot it was and I just burned up my hand and I, I don't know if I smelled the smoke or heard the hiss or what 
but uh, I realized, ah, oh, look what you've done now. You've burned up your hand. And as I was standing there, kind of like in a daze, and I was sort of sad and mad and angry, um, the thought came to me, well, you know, I do remember hearing about three guys that went into a furnace and weren't harmed by that somehow. Somehow they knew something that was able to negate the effect of the heat on their flesh. And whatever it is they knew is still true. They didn't make it up. They simply understood it. And it's still true. It's kind of like um, when the Wright brothers, I don't know if you've read that book, um, it's called um, The Wright Brothers by David McCulloch. It came out a couple of years ago. But uh, Wilbur Wright, the older brother, used to get asked to speak now and then. And at one of these places, it was um, probably a gymnasium like this, he, um, he dropped a piece of paper and it fluttered to the ground. And he said, that's what we're trying to understand. Okay? They didn't make that up. They just harnessed it. They just figured out how it works. And that's all we're doing. It's, it's divinely natural and we're learning it humanly. You know, I have a friend, by the way, um, I used to work with her, and she evidently for around 10 years was unable to walk. It was before I knew her. And uh, one day she was reading this book, and the idea came to her, you know, this is true for you. And uh, that was the end of it. She stood up, and she's been walking ever since. And not long ago, she sailed her sailboat from the Atlantic Ocean into the Great Lakes through all those inland waterways and so forth. So she's fully active. So the truth that is true remains true. Um, you've all heard that time heals. Time heals all wounds. And yet, I'll bet you everyone knows somebody, maybe yourselves, who have sort of never quite gotten over something. Somebody stabbed them or somebody betrayed them or something. Uh, and so time doesn't really do that. Time can't really think. Time can't do anything. But thought will change. You know, one time I was, uh, I used to play um, platform tennis and I used to play a lot of it uh, every platform tennis. You ever heard of that? It's a game, um, and you play it in New England uh, and they play, they play it all over the place, but you play it outdoors in the winter and you have to shovel the court off in order to play it. You play it in a cage, you play it with paddles, not, not, not rackets, but it's tennis. You can play doubles or singles. Anyway, I was playing one time and um, I sprained an ankle. And I've sprained my ankles a lot over the years. I guess you could say I've had chronically sprained ankles, which simply means over time, by the way. Chronically just means over time. Anyway, I taped it up with some duct tape and went back out to play. But the ankle was kind of weak, so I took a couple weeks off. Tried to play again, couldn't play. Took a couple more weeks off. Then I sprained it again. Just walking in my driveway, which is a huge setback. If you're allowing time to heal you, it's a huge setback when you're walking in your driveway and you sprain your ankle again after waiting four weeks. And then I was walking, a couple weeks later, I was walking two dogs in the woods near my home and I sprained it again. So now I'm standing on one foot, really sad, um, not knowing really even how I'm going to get out of here because I can't really walk. And the thought came to me, you know, Dave, time and rest are not making that ankle stronger. If anything, it's getting weaker. You're spraining it over nothing. You're just walking your dog, spraining your ankle. You have to think differently. I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. I'm standing on one foot. I, I got nothing better to do. And then the thought came, you've got to think radically differently. And I thought, okay, I'll think radically differently. What's the radical thought? And it came to me, the original accident never happened. That's way radical. That's ludicrous radical. Because obviously, I've been spraining my ankle all my life. Both of them. So the original accident never happened is radical. And then I thought, okay, I accept. 
The original accident never happened. Now what? I might have even said that aloud. I was just by myself in the woods, two dogs running ahead of me. Then the next thought came to me, better be careful walking out of here though because you got ice and snow and horse hoof prints and all this stuff on the path and you don't want to re-injure yourself. That's when I caught it. That's when I caught myself. And I thought, hold it. If I just accepted this radical premise that it never happened, why would I be careful not to re-injure it? Would you? I thought, no, I wouldn't, and I'm not going to, and I began to walk. From the moment the foot hit the ground, I could feel the strength in it. It was that quick. It was like immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. It was that quick. It was immediate. And as I walked out, I could think, every time that foot hit the ground, I thought, that foot is stronger than it's ever been. That foot is stronger than the other ankle. And um, to tell you the truth, I've never sprained my ankles since, and I've never taped them since. And I used to tape them, I mean tape them, with pump up basketball shoes and all kinds of stuff, stabilize them, none of that. I've never had it, never had it occur. So when you accept that radical premise that you've always been free, even though you've had a history of not being free, it changes things. And not just for you. It's never happened for anybody. You know, the man of God, throughly furnished, includes ankles. Right? The man of God is throughly furnished and he has everything that he needs. You know, just to touch quickly on this concept of age, um, the world always wants to know your age. It, I, anytime I get on an airplane, I have to put in my age. Uh, and I recommend that you think differently for yourself. Do not allow yourself to be hypnotized into thinking that you're a, uh, a mortal that is aging. And it's, the world thinks it, and you might agree with it. And I would say, no, no I don't really agree with that. Agree with the fact that you're a spiritual idea, that you are uh, uh, throughly furnished, that you're timeless and ageless and useful and indestructible and that you always will be. And time can't dictate that. It's kind of like what I learned on that motorcycle. Time cannot take away your life. Not all at once and not in little increments. You know, I would like to read something from this book, Science and Health. And this is kind of instructive, I think. It says here, the measurement of life by solar years robs youth and gives ugliness to age. Never record ages. Chronological data are no part of the vast forever. Chronological data do not enter into our spiritual lives. Timetables of birth and death are so many conspiracies against manhood and womanhood. And, uh, you know, we don't need conspiracies. Uh, in Spanish, they have a beautiful little statement that I like. Tengo muchos años, pero no tengo edad. I have many years, but no age. You can have a lot of value, a lot of experiences. Don't tie that to an age. You are ageless. And you've got, as long as you've got value, deliver that value. Don't tie it to an age. And don't think you're doing pretty good for your age. You are ageless. You know, there was a guy that came up to me after one of these events and he said, Dave, you've got to see my new car. It's a brand new Ford Mustang. So we went out to look at it and, and he was proudly showing me this brand new car and he said, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a midlife crisis for me. I said, no, nah, man, that's a God-given Ford Mustang. Don't tie it to an age. Don't tie it to a mortal concept. It's, it's uh, part of your life and don't make it a mortal part of a mortal life. Immortal measurements, this is simply the concept that you're not actually measuring anything by time. Like if you give um, your employer a day's work, you could measure that a couple different ways. You could say, I'm going to do that for eight hours. Or you could say, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to give them, them the benefit of my thinking. They may not even deserve it. Or you may feel they don't deserve it. But you do deserve it. Do your best. 
Um, mine measures time according to the good that is unfolded. So if you go in and punch a clock, excellent, particularly if you show up on time. But if you go in there and think and deliver value, now you've done something. That's where the action is. It's like that woman on the stairs. She could have delivered some bad news to her boss and, and left for the weekend, but she didn't do that. She solved that problem on the stairs. The boss may never have heard about it until after it was already done. Just a final thing, maybe this might be a, just one thought to leave you with. Um, again, this is uh, from an article written a, a long time ago by Mary Baker Eddy uh, in an article called The New Birth, which uh, occurred in the, in the uh, was printed originally in the Christian Science Journal. And it talks about our moments. And I just thought it's interesting for us to just look at how simple these moments are. These are moments of surrender to God, moments of childlike trust, joyful adoption of good, moments of self-abnegation. By the way, self-abnegation means uh, putting yourself out of the picture. Uh, put the greater good at the center of your picture and that will bless you too. Um, Self-consecration, heaven-born hope and spiritual love. So just quickly to, to kind of recap what we've discussed, we're talking about the truth. Um, the Bible contains it in a thousand different ways. This book, Science and Health, explains it. And again, you probably have a Bible. If you don't have a copy of Science and Health, I would, get, I would take some steps to get one. Either pick one up here, stop by the reading room here in Ipswich, or frankly, they've got reading rooms all over the, all over the world. You can stop and grab one. Um, in metaphysics, time is not a factor. In, in physics, it is. But in metaphysics, it's totally irrelevant, and it's... it's uh, immediacy, which means already, begins to appear. If it's yours to do, do it. Don't let the clock tell you what's yours to do. The clock may tell you how fast it's going to happen, but the, the, uh, the clock cannot dictate to you what you can and can't do. And, um, and it's the Christ, though, that enables it. This, this, this Christ, which fed multitudes, which, uh, which healed immediately, uh, and that Christ consciousness that Jesus embodied, but he told us also, he said, if you remember, he said, uh, uh, you believe on me, Christ, the works that I do shall ye do also, and greater works than these shall ye do. So uh, 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 the Christ enables you to do what is yours to do. Um, if it's ever been true, it's still true. Truth does not come and go. Truth is not fashion or fad. Truth is true. It's like two plus two is four. Be as ageless as you can, I, I, without lying. I don't think I would lie about your age. I know somebody who did and then they couldn't get back online because they forgot what they put in there. I, I don't think I would do that. Um, but I'd stay out of that age business to the best of your ability. Uh, think of yourself as ageless, timeless, useful. Um, and then immortal measurements, again, just simply means let your life be about good. Do some good. Don't put in hours. Do good. And then um, this is um, being sponsored today by First Church of Christ Sinus right here in Ipswich, right over on Main Street. Uh, services on Sundays at 10 and Wednesdays at 7.30. Have I got that right? Is that all correct? Good. And uh, that's what it looks like. It's right in the middle of... Uh, the, kind of the most beautiful part of the city, I think. And also the reading room, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Those are the hours there. And the reading room is also right there. So you're always welcome there. You should go on in anywhere in Ipswich. And frankly, anywhere in the, in the area. These are just a few just in the northern Boston area of the churches and reading rooms that exist. So if you want to pursue any of these ideas, there are a lot of ways to do it. Also, some online resources, including ChristianScience.com, which will give you links to whatever's going on anywhere in the world, whether it's practitioners or teachers or classes or uh, lectures um, in any language in any country. So, and then if you do want that, um, if you want a copy of that reading list, you can download it from my website, and I'd be glad to, glad to uh, have you have it. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you.